Welcome everyone, Byron White here. We're going to start this webinar in about a minute. I'm just going to take a, a few seconds to walk you through some uh, some of the fundamentals from these webinars. Uh, first of all, I want to wel welcome Roger. Roger, welcome. Hey, Byron. Good to be here. Thanks. I was so excited to see your initial deck come over the screen. It was about 160 slides, which we thought were absolutely brilliant and fascinating. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do my job to not uh, not take much time up. I know you've got a lot you want to share with people. I know you've trimmed the deck down a little bit, so we'll we'll get through it and hopefully leave about 10 minutes uh, to for everybody to chime in with some questions. Um, yeah, but, but, um, it's kind of like stop <laughs> <and> animation. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but you're the author, of course, of Brainfluence, 100 Ways to Persuade and Convince Consumers with Neuromarketing. Um, and let me just ask you one quick question. When did you, how did you arrive on this neuromarketing topic and, and become a, a, an expert in it? Well, actually, I'm going to not answer that question because I spend 30 seconds at the start and I've got a few slides that explain ah. that little story. So I, I'm going to have to ask you to wait, Byron. Perfect. Fair enough. And let me go to my details. Kelly, flip the switch on the next slide and we'll uh, be taking a look at uh, a couple of talking points here. Um, yes, this webinar is being recorded. Always a favorite question that everyone seems to ask me um, every time. I'll be manning the, the chat box um, inside, so if you have questions or having uh, some issues, just feel free to raise your hand by opening up a chat with me and I'll get, I'll get an answer right back to you. Uh, while Roger's talking. Um, everyone's going to get a link to the recording as well. Uh, please send me uh, questions directly using the, 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 uh, the question uh, formula um, that you'll see in the, on your, on your GoToWebinar. And please, please, please share some love with us and, and talk about us. Use hashtag right tag. And of course, you can reach me um, at Byron White or at, at, at Roger Dooley. So, um, really, that's about it. Let's look at one more slide. I think we had some other logistics um, to go over. Everybody knows who I am. Um, I'm the uh, a founder and CEO of Writer Access. We've got lots of people tuned into this webinar. Uh, this is, I think, our 70-something. We're getting close to 70, 71 maybe webinars that we've done in this series. Uh, so we're, we're super excited to have shared lots of knowledge, and this is going to be a great one. So without further ado, um, a little bit about the host, although the host is, is today's guest is going to be talking talking a lot about himself apparently. So we'll let, we'll let uh, really let the turn things over I think at this point to Roger. Roger, take it away. Great. Okay, we'll try and do that here, see if the technology works. And Okay. I think I have control. Can you see my screen? It should be a title slide. Yes, indeed. Looks great. Oh, okay, excellent. In that case, and I'm not going to spend too long talking about myself, but uh, just uh, uh, since it's sort of a strange uh, topic, uh, considering my background, I spent a few seconds on it. So. Uh, just uh, figure out, okay, there we go. Uh, as a reminder, I am at Roger Dooley, and the hashtag for this webinar is right on. And uh, um, there's the background part. I started off life a long time ago as an engineer in college, and even then I was pulled in a couple of directions. Psychology was one. I minored in psychology, and the other kind of inexplicably was advertising when I was supposed to be in the library studying differential equations. Instead, I'd go over to the periodical section and read Ad Age. Uh, but then I began my career pretty much as a normal engineer, worked my way into project management and product management. And finally, when my corporate career seemed to be taking off, I was in charge of strategy for a Fortune 1000 company. I chose at that moment to bail out of the corporate world and become an entrepreneur. And the business that I co-founded was in the direct marketing business in the early days of home computers. And this was a very appealing kind of marketing for me because it was the most quantitative kind of marketing available at the time. Uh, not much compared to what we have today, but uh, we could do A-B tests. We could do a square inch analysis. And we actually knew, compared to most marketers, what was working and what wasn't. And over time, uh, that business morphed into some different businesses, more in the digital space. Uh, it also turned into a business called College Confidential, which is actually a content-driven business, although this one is a user-generated content kind of business, and sold that a few years ago to part of the Daily Mail group. Uh, and uh, at the same time as the rest of this stuff was going on, about 
11 years ago, uh, I saw the confluence of two areas, neuroscience and marketing. And I wasn't the only person, uh, certainly, uh, but I did what any good digital marketer would do, and I went out and I registered a domain, neuroscience marketing, oddly enough, and uh, began writing there. And uh, after about uh, yeah, five, five years of writing, uh, my uh, book came out from Wiley Brainfluence, and it's now in eight or nine languages around the world. Uh, and my latest book is in Kindle format, and it is the persuasion slide. We're going to touch a little bit on the model that's in that book as we go forward here. Hey, now, Roger. Yes. I want to just interrupt you real quick. The, you want to want to hit the play button on your PowerPoint because um, we need to see your entire screen. We're, we're seeing the same view that you are, which is just a small version of your PowerPoint. So just hit. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. View slideshow. Well, what's, what's strange is, um, okay. Now, what I did was, oh, you know, maybe what I need to do is change what I'm sharing. If I start the slide. I don't think you can go in presentation mode. I think that's the problem. You need to view the actual slideshow from, from the ground zero up. Right. Okay. So uh, let me give this a shot here. Has this worked before? So let me, let me try this. Go over here. Let's go to... Okay, and now let me see which, if I can control what I'm sharing here. I think if you hit the play button, I think on the slideshow, that should launch um, it. Well, actually what I need to do then, I think, is, uh, ah, here we go. Let's try this. There you go. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, a little, little bit uh, tricky, but we we're glad we're in business now. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, the because uh, I, I can actually see it on my my end the uh, the full slide, so um, I had no idea that you guys were not seeing the whole thing. Okay, so I'm assuming we have some folks uh, in the listening group here who are content marketers, and I've got some potentially uh, distressing stats to share. When Gallup asked people about the honesty and ethics of different professions, nurses came out on top uh, with rated 85% for having high or very high honesty and ethics. Engineers, my original profession, did pretty well at 70%. But when it came to advertisers and marketers, uh, not so good. They came out at 11%. And about the only uh, good thing that they can say is that salespeople did even worse at 8%. Uh, and it's not just regular people who distrust marketers. Uh, CEOs were asked about their C-level execs and whether they thought they were uh, fully competent to do their job. And 90% said their CFOs were. Uh, about the same number said their chief information officers were. Uh, but when it came to their chief marketing officers, only 20% had that level of confidence, which is really scary when you think about it, uh, that uh, four out of five CEOs aren't too sure about their chief marketing person. Uh, and you might ask why that is, and I think that the biggest reason is that so much marketing and sales money is wasted. Uh, and there's probably no better metric of this uh, than e-commerce, where last year a $1.7 trillion, with a T, uh, went through the e-commerce channel in terms of revenue, but $4 trillion, three times as much, was abandoned in e-commerce shopping carts. So you think of all the money that went into driving that traffic through SEO, through content creation, pay-per-click ads, and so on, all the web design and everything else, uh, all for naught when people got just up to the point of completing the transaction and then bailed out. And, you know, I could go on and on. 95% uh, of new products fail. There, 98% uh, of direct mail gets no response, and on and on. But uh, really what we need is a revolution. And the good thing is we have one. Uh, for millennia, everybody thought that the universe revolved around the Earth. Uh, and then Copernicus and Galileo came along and demonstrated that, that really uh, that wasn't true. And in fact, even in our own solar system, the Earth was a pretty small player. Uh, and uh, similarly, for millennia, people thought that um, our behavior as humans revolved around our conscious mind. And as John Barg from Yale so eloquently put it, just as Galileo removed the Earth from the center of the universe, uh, 
Today's scientific revolution removes the conscious mind from the center of human behavior. Now, you might ask how much of, of our thought processes and decision-making processes are conscious. Uh, and the best estimate that I've seen uh, is uh, from Gerald Zaltman at Harvard, who estimates that only 5% of those processes are conscious and 95% are non-conscious. So uh, as content creators and writers, you have to ask yourself, how much of your reader's brain are you really writing for? That little tiny conscious part, or are you also addressing the non-conscious part? Now, uh, there's different kinds of neuromarketing. Uh, uh, we're going to be focused on what I call passive neuromarketing. That is, it doesn't involve using fMRI or EEG to study the um, performance of specific ads. Uh, that's one thing that may, you may have seen in terms of being a neuromarketing where people are put into various machines and their brains are watched while they view, say, a Super Bowl ad. Uh, but instead, we're going to uh, talk about something that's more applying uh, some of the science from both neuroscience and behavior research. Uh, and uh, Persuasion psychology is a field that was probably invented by Robert Cialdini with his famous six principles. We're not going to go through them all. You probably know them. Things like social proof, that if you see other people doing something, you are more likely to do that same thing yourself. Reciprocity, if I do something for you, you're more likely to do something for me, and so on. Uh, a very different approach comes from B.J. Fogg at Stanford, who we're not going to get into the, his equation here, but basically he said that to change someone's behavior, as in, say, placing an order or filling out a form on a website, you need three things. You need uh, motivation and ability uh, and then a trigger. And you'll see an echo of this when we talk about my persuasion slide a little bit because it's based in part on uh, B.J.'s behavior model. Uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for his many, many years of research, and uh, he divides our thought processes into System 1 and System 2. System 1 uh, is uh, fast, intuitive, emotional, rule-based, and very energy efficient. System 2 is what we think about when we um, talk about thinking, which is that sort of a logical, rational, conscious, grinding through a process. And one of his key findings was uh, that our brains are lazy. Our brains already consume an outsized portion of our body's energy. And uh, when uh, they are in system two, uh, it's uncomfortable, it's high energy usage. Uh, and so the, our brains will always default to system one for when they have, have to make a decision, if that's at all possible. And when you're uh, writing for somebody or when you're trying to persuade them, uh, when you're pushing them into system two with a lot of facts, figures, text, and so on, uh, that's uncomfortable and they want to get out of that as quickly as possible. Another approach comes from evolutionary psychology. Jeffrey Miller wrote an entire book called Spent on how our behavior today as modern consumers in this world of uh, iPhones and Facebook and so on uh, is driven by programs that were laid down tens of thousands of years ago. Uh, then uh, we've got hundreds or thousands of behavior researchers around the country and around the world who are conducting experiments that uh, help determine particular aspects of human behavior, some of which we can apply as marketers and content creators. And the takeaway from all that is that there's no single theory or approach that you can use to explain all the behavior of your customers or your readers. Uh, you have to pick and choose those things that are going to work best. And one problem that you may run into uh, is uh, this sort of what do we put into an ad, what do we put into a piece of content, uh, where a bunch of people have different ideas, particularly if it has, to, say, to do with products. Some people want to emphasize features and benefits. Other people want to emphasize uh, reviews or uh, pricing. Uh, and then you've got the people who want to take a more psychological approach. And uh, often this decision ends up being made by the uh, ranking person in the room who just makes a gut call. And uh, to help with this kind of decision-making process, I came up with a model called the persuasion slide. And uh, what it's designed to do is bring some of those elements of persuasion psychology uh, into your decision-making process in a logical way, in a simple framework uh, based on the playground slide. Uh, and I, I'm not going to 
devote a lot of time to this slide here because we're going to cover the elements, but there are only four elements in the slide, and it's, it's really quite a very simple framework. Uh, so, and each one of these has a conscious and a non-conscious component, which you could also think of if you look at Kahneman in terms of, say, a system one and a system two component. Uh, the first element is gravity, and that's your customer, your reader's initial motivation. That's what they're coming to you with, their basic wants and needs. Uh, and some of these may be very conscious needs. Others uh, may be not so conscious on their part, but they're still very important to them. Uh, and uh, what I see a lot is marketers who are fighting gravity. They're telling their visitor, their reader, their customer that do this because we need you to, as opposed to focusing on the visitor's need or the reader's need. A uh, good example, I visited a website uh, that offered editing services and I uh, was confronted with this thing where I only wanted some information and their call to action was place an order. Uh, and that was totally not aligned with my uh, gravity at that point, which was simply to get more information and learn about what they were offering. On the other hand, uh, if you work with gravity, you're telling people how you will help them meet their needs. Uh, one, one site that does a nice job of that, uh, uh, perhaps a little bit over the top, it's called IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com. It's Ramit Sethi's site. You may have heard of him. He's a well-known internet marketer and also, I believe, a student of B.J. Fogg's at one time. And what he uh, does when you go to his site is hit you with these messages like, uh, subscribe and I'll show you how to make 10K in 10 minutes or make $1,000 a month uh, in your spare time. Uh, and these messages uh, may or may not be highly believable, but what I give them credit for is they are totally aligned with people who come to his website, which is I will teach you to be rich. They want uh, obviously to have more money in their life and his messaging is totally aligned with that need. Uh, uh, the next element is the nudge. Uh, that is how you get your uh, reader, your visitor, your customer's attention. And it can take a lot of forms. It could be an email, a pop-up ad, a, a search ad, a banner ad, some kind of a very visible call to action on a page, even a, a telephone call. Uh, but I see a lot of very ineffective bad nudges out there. Just about every blogger or news type site wants you to subscribe. That's how they typically make their money and uh, build and retain engagement from their users. And here's an example. The nudge to subscribe is this little tiny envelope icon that nobody's going to see. And even if people do see it, they won't have a clue as to what it is. I contrast that with my friend Chris Brogan, who is a very skilled marketer. Uh, probably many of you have know him and have seen his site. When you go to any content page on his website, a third of that page is devoted to his nudge to subscribe. It's got his picture in it to get your, his, your attention. He starts with, you want to grow your business, which is totally aligned with the gravity of his visitors who are entrepreneurs who typically want to grow their business. And uh, it's really impossible to go to his site and not get that nudge. But just in case you miss that, uh, after a few seconds, you'll see a pop-up. Uh, that again nudges you to subscribe, telling you that you'll get his best stuff for free and uh, what you're going to learn. So again, very aligned with what his visitors want in coming to the site. So you can't go to Chris's site and not be nudged a couple of times. Uh, the key thing is it has to be seen or otherwise experienced and it has to begin the motivation process because sometimes you'll see a nudge that has no motivation. A uh, good example, uh, LinkedIn does a nice job of nudging you by putting your photo from your profile in other people's ads. You can't really not look at that. You see your picture over there, you gotta see why your picture is there. Uh, in this case, they wanted me to follow Comcast business, but they gave me zero reason to do that. I'm not a Comcast subscriber, I'm not even in their territory. And uh, as a result, uh, this nudge did absolutely nothing for me. Uh, the uh, nudge should have uh, at least a little bit of motivation. Now let's talk about motivation because that's what determines the angle of the slide. And uh, clearly if there's a steep angle, people will get to the bottom of the slide. And those conscious motivators, remember we can have conscious and non-conscious elements in all of these, uh, can include things like the features and benefits, the discounts, uh, gifts that you might offer somebody, product specifications, pricing, 
all of those things are geared toward your customers or your reader's conscious mind. Non-conscious motivators are things like emotional appeals, appeals based on psychology, uh, even appeals based on cognitive biases that are sometimes called brain bugs, sort of weird little ways that our human brains work. And in most cases, to be persuasive and to get that steep angle of the slide, you're going to want to include both conscious and non-conscious motivators. Now, conscious things are can be things like benefits. You see a lot of these, uh, how much the customer is going to save or how good or effective the product is or that there's a money-back guarantee. Gifts and discounts are pretty common. If you go to most information websites that want you to subscribe, they'll offer you a free ebook or a free video or something like that. Uh, sales are very common in retail. In fact, they're the primary motivator. Uh, one company tried an experiment a couple of years ago uh, saying, well, this is kind of crazy because everybody in our business marks stuff up to ridiculously high prices. They never sell the product at that price. They mark it down 40 or 50 percent and send, uh, uh, this is how they get their customers in. We're going to do something a lot smarter. We're going to make things simpler for our customers. We're going to offer everyday low prices all the time. They know that they can come into our store and always get the best price. And uh, they continued to advertise in the same way by sending out weekly sale flyers. Uh, and that was J.C. Penney, as you may have guessed by now. And what happened was their sales absolutely tanked compared to their competition uh, to the point where within a year uh, they were teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. Uh, so, and what was happening was uh, that they were nudging their customers with those weekly sale flyers, but they didn't have the discounts, and hence there was very little motivation compared to what the competition was offering, and it killed their business. So uh, they fired that CEO that initiated that plan, uh, brought in uh, another one who went back to all sales all the time. Now you can go to their homepage. It's going to look different than this, but every few days it changes, but it is all sales all the time. It's always percent off, dollars off, uh, because they realized they needed that motivation. The problem with that kind of motivation is that it costs money to use it, uh, whereas non-conscious motivators tend to be uh, free and often can be even more effective. Um, let's take a look at Amazon. We think of them as being a uh, sort of very rational, uh, conscious type sale. They've got these pages that are loaded with information, uh, all this uh, stuff going on. But if you look at some of the non-conscious motivators they use, uh, they've got social proof with their uh, stars and their number of reviews. Uh, in this case, they've got scarcity, where they show that there's only a limited number left in stock. Another one of Cialdini's motivators, uh, they use free uh, to describe a uh, the Audible version, which isn't exactly free, but uh, they know that's a powerful motivator, and they use free in their shipping area. Uh, they hide text to prevent information overload. Uh, they use authority. You can't quite see it on this screen, but just below the edge there, uh, we've got reviews from best-selling authors. Uh, so uh, they've got all these non-conscious appeals going on, too, in addition to uh, what they uh, is obviously there on the page. So let me give you an example. I'm sure we've got a few pet owners uh, in the audience. Uh, this was my little puppy a few years ago. Uh, he was a cute little guy, he was a rescue, uh, and he was kind of funny looking, so we decided to name him after the uh, comedian Conan O'Brien. And uh, we had no idea how big he was going to get because he was uh, really uh, uh, just a tiny dog then. Uh, and he kind of grew and grew and turned into the other Conan. Uh, now uh, he's about 80 pounds and uh, thinks he's one of the family. And you know, we know that our lives are a lot richer uh, because he's been part of it. And what I've done there in 30 seconds is create what Cialdini would call a liking effect by showing what I have in common with the dog owners and pet owners in the audience, and maybe even the other, for the other folks, uh, I have humanized myself a little bit. And uh, this is a very powerful tool you can use by showing attributes uh, that you share or your client shares or your company shares uh, with your customer. Uh, one company that does a brilliant job of that is PetSmart, where instead of the usual stiff executive poses with a bunch of sober looking individuals in suits, uh, they're all uh, holding big fluffy dogs and cats, and big smiles on their faces like they're really happy. Oh, are these their pets, or do they rent them for the photo shoot? Uh, don't know, uh, but what that does is it tells their customers, uh, we are like you. 
uh, and uh, gives them that trust and that liking effect. Uh, the only thing I would do is put these liking cues where people can see them uh, rather than burying them on an about page that really relatively few people are going to get to. The companies that I see this use effectively put them on the home page, uh, they put them on the appropriate content pages and so on. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about uh, some brainy hacks here, uh, uh, some non-conscious motivators that you can build into your copy and your content. And one that you're probably already well familiar with is the idea that stories are effective. Uh, this ad sold for 30 years uh, despite really being a, a bad looking ad with way too much content. And the reason that it worked is because it told a story of this guy who amazed his friends by his ability to play piano after taking these music lessons. Uh, and the reason stories are so effective is because we evolved to pay attention to them. Uh, in our early days as humans, one person could come back to the community and explain where they went that day and tell people where there was danger, where there was food, and everyone else didn't have to experience that on their own. And uh, over time, that evolved into a preference for listening to that kind of information. And even today, when you put somebody in an fMRI machine and measure what's going on in their brain while they're listening to a story, you see the motor areas light up as if they were carrying out those same actions, uh, even though they're totally immobilized in this noisy tube. Uh, and another experiment had two people in separate fMRI machines with one telling the other a story. Uh, and what that showed was that within a few seconds of the first person starting the story, the second person's brain actually synchronized with the first person. So uh, if you want to exercise mind control over somebody, uh, tell them a story. Uh, it's about the most effective form of mind control that you can have, at least outside of science fiction. Uh, another way you can incorporate that same effect is by incorporating them in your testimonials. Testimonials are great, they're a form of social proof, but when you can turn your testimonial into an entire story, uh, it's going like this diet site did, where it starts with this person's childhood, their experiences, and then their uh, romantic issues later on, and so on. Uh, it makes your content much more memorable uh, and has much greater impact. Uh, Another little hack that you can use is to surprise your reader's brain. Uh, and that's because our brains are prediction machines. Even as I'm talking, you think you know what I'm going to say next. And usually you're right, uh, but you can shake people up with unexpected words. So for instance, we know that a stitch in time saves money. Uh, that will immediately uh, jolt your reader's brain into paying attention to what it is that you're saying. So you can do this with any phrase where people think they know what's coming next and then changing it. Uh, another kind of similar technique is to use what's called a functional shift. Uh, this is something that Shakespeare did where he would use a word in an unusual context, like use a noun in a verb form. Uh, and uh, they actually put people in fMRI machines and showed that uh, their attention spiked uh, when uh, they hit one of these unusually used words. So for instance, instead of saying, we used mobile technology to beat our competitors, we Ubered our competitors. And that's immediately going to make people figure out what do they mean, huh? They, they Ubered them, uh, and it'll make them pay attention. Uh, another thing you can do is rebrand with uh, just your choice of words. I'm guessing that nobody, even among our hundreds of listeners here today, started off with a nice big slice of carrot cake this morning. But uh, it's pretty likely that at least a few of you had muffins, which of course are a cake, but uh, it's been rebranded as a breakfast food that's uh, healthy, particularly if it's carrot, because we all know carrots are good for you, even with the cream cheese frosting on top. Uh, and uh, one test had people evaluate how healthy different food items were, uh, and they were the exact same ingredients. So the descriptions were the same, but when the name of the product was adjusted, uh, they found that, for instance, uh, a uh, salad was more healthy than the same stuff when they, it was called pasta. Uh, fruit chews, of course, were more healthy than candy chews and so on. Uh, so you can rename your category. Uh, politically, uh, renaming the estate tax as the death tax is a brilliant move because an estate tax sounds like something that rich people would pay, or a death tax, that sounds ominous. Uh, nobody thought about putting liquid soap in their shower until it was rebranded as shower gel. And now we've all got a bottle of that stuff in our showers. Uh, uh, another way you can uh, change up your copy is to use real numbers instead of percentages. Uh, 
this experiment had psych psychiatrists uh, who were uh, in charge of e evaluating whether people should be released from institutions. Uh, if they would release a, pr a patient in six, if in six months uh, there was a 20% chance that he would commit a violent act, or if another group was asked if 20 out of 100 such patients committed violent acts, would they release them? And now these. They mean the exact same thing. In the first case, 79% said they would release that person. In the second one, only 59%. So a big difference, despite the fact the numbers are the same. Now, I still find both those numbers kind of scary, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, uh, some conventional wisdom for writing copy is that adjectives slow the reader down and you should take them out whenever possible. Uh, now. Uh, the other day at Panera, uh, I had this sandwich, it was ha ham, egg, and cheese, uh, but that isn't what they called it. Uh, they went through this amazing thing talking about lean, hardwood smoked ham, uh, freshly cracked eggs, and so on. Uh, and uh, it sounds like overkill, but these adjectives actually work. Um, a study uh, done by Brian Wansig at Cornell found a 27% sales boost when adjectives uh, were used, and the characteristics of the adjectives that worked were things like if they were vivid, if they were sensory, emotional or nostalgic, like grandma's recipe, uh, very specific or branded, like say Jack Daniel's barbecue sauce as opposed to barbecue sauce. Uh, something that you should know about as content creators is uh, there is such a thing as too much information. Uh, uh, here's an example of a product description that has a lot of information, uh, and here's one that has almost no information about the product. It's got a big photo and the price and very little else. And uh, both of these can be effective, but uh, when you've got a lot of content out there like that, all that descriptive information, uh, what it can do is kick people into that uncomfortable system two kind of thinking. Instead of them just saying, oh, I like the way that product looks, I think I'll buy it, uh, it gets them into this analysis mode that may cause them to decide to look for more information, look at other products, and so on. Uh, and uh, so often it's better to have minimal information uh, but have it there for those people who really want to want that because sometimes they need that extra info. And e-commerce companies like Zappos are getting smarter about doing this. What they do is they hide most of the information and they display that there's more available in a clever way rather than putting it behind a tab like some places do that say they have a tab for specifications. What they do is they've got this little slightly faded out line of text that visually communicates there's more if you want it, but they don't push that uh, into your face if you don't need it. Now, uh, as content creators, you should know that the content, uh, the way the content is presented can have a big impact on how it's perceived and processed uh, by your readers. One example is in pricing. Uh, this is a price. Uh, and this is a price. Now those prices look identical except for the color. The second one is red in case anybody is entirely colorblind. And uh, they would be the same if you were addressing only female readers or female viewers. Uh, but for men, that red price appears to be about twice as powerful a discount, about twice as big a discount as that exact same price printed in black. Uh, don't ask me to justify it, but uh, that is the way it is. Similarly, um, a group of scientists asked people to evaluate tomato soup. Uh, and the test really wasn't about the soup so much as the sign next to the soup. Uh, half the people saw it with this sort of simple courier font, uh, and another half saw it with a more elegant Lucinda font. And what they found was, uh, when they asked people how they liked the taste of the soup and whether they would buy the product, the people who saw it in, described in the more elegant font thought it was much tastier and were twice as likely to say they would definitely buy the product. Same soup, of course. Uh, now, I could go on and on all day, but uh, we do have a time limit here. And what I encourage you to do is read uh, many of the great books uh, on the topic. There are also some great blogs out there these days that are mining that uh, influence psychology field that you can find little tweaks and hacks that will work specifically for your situation. Now, the final element of our persuasion slide is friction. Uh, you've perhaps seen a kid get stuck halfway down the slide because it was rusty or badly maintained. Uh, and in our case, that represents both real and perceived difficulty. 
Real friction are things, uh, in a, say, in a checkout process like long, many form fields, uh, a lengthy checkout process, instructions that people have to read, confusion that people don't know what to do, uh, just about anything involved in uh, that stands between whatever the, uh, the visitor or viewer reader is doing and what you want them to do. Uh, here's an example of a um, high friction form. I got an email inviting me to read an article. Okay, this was a content marketing ploy, pure and simple. And they said, hey, uh, uh, Roger, here's an article we think you'll like. I said, yeah, that seems interesting. I clicked on it. And instead of seeing the article, I got this form with a dozen fields with really confusing questions like, uh, do you have a solution now? Uh, how, when will you buy a solution? I had no idea what kind of a solution they were talking about. Uh, uh, all I want to do is read the damn article. So I did what probably 99% of the people who got there did, clicked the back button and want, went on with my life. I, Staples is known for their easy button, and not long ago I went to their website to buy some uh, an ink cartridge for my printer. And uh, when I went to check out, I dropped it and I got to this form, and you can't read anything on it because I had to paste together like four or five screens just to get it on this slide. And uh, I looked at that, I scrolled up and down, those grayish areas are instructions, uh, I don't know what they said, took one look at that and I jumped in my car, went to Office Max, it's like eight minutes away, and came home with the cartridge that I needed. Uh, and it, unwittingly, I became part of that $4 trillion in abandoned shopping carts because for all I know, that ink cartridge is still in my Staples cart. Uh, Amazon, on the other hand, has perfected near zero friction. Uh, all you have to do is click that uh, one button, you know how much it's going to cost, when it's going to get to your address, you can even choose the address that you want. Uh, they have no abandoned shopping carts when you use that one click button because it goes straight from your hand to their fulfillment system. Uh, now the other kind of friction is something you need to be aware about as you're writing, uh, and that's imaginary friction, and it's related to what's called cognitive fluency. Uh, Things that are difficult for our brains to process uh, have a uh, bad effect. For instance, names that are hard to pronounce uh, are more dangerous uh, than simple ones. For instance, in evaluating an amusement park ride, uh, this one with a really complicated name was seen as riskier, even though the photo and the descriptions and everything else were the same. The same thing was found for prescription drugs. Uh, but it's, uh, that cognitive fluency affects us in other ways. When uh, Adam Alter, a researcher, uh, had his grad students evaluate a confession site where people posted confessions of bad things they did to other people anonymously, uh, there was an unwitting A-B test where it started off with a sort of hard to read white on black design. They switched to a much easier to read black on white design. And what they found was after analyzing thousands of these posts was that the more fluent site, the easier to read site, uh, was much more, the posts were much more revealing. People were more willing to give up their sorry details when it was easier. Uh, similarly, with uh, when people were asked to choose between two similar phones, uh, half read the description in an easy to read Arial font, only 17% couldn't decide. When uh, the other group saw it in this sort of, uh, still easy to read, but a little bit more difficult embossed italic font, 40% couldn't decide. The difficulty in reading translated into difficulty in deciding. And the, the classic example of this phenomenon uh, uh, was done at the University of Minnesota, where they asked people, how long will it take to perform these simple exercises? And there were just two sentences uh, very simple about tucking your chin into your chest and lifting it up in six to ten repetitions. Uh, the text was the same, the size was the same. One was in a very easy to read Arial font, the other was in a slightly more difficult but perfectly legible brushy font. Uh, the first group said it would take eight minutes to do those exercises. The second group said 15 minutes, so almost twice as long despite the fact that the text was the same. So uh, the way the content that you create is presented can make a huge difference uh, both in its persuasiveness and even in whether people will say, oh, that looks like something I'd read or something that uh, that looks too difficult, I'm going to skip over and go on to the next thing. And so you can minimize your content friction with simple fonts, uh, short text, uh, and a really easy to read design. And uh, one thing I would say is if uh, if you're looking at a website, a landing page, um, a product page, 
if you've got stuff on that page, whether it's content or imagery or anything else that isn't somehow motivating uh, your visitor, reader, customer to take an action, uh, then it's friction and should probably be removed. So uh, just to wrap up our little slide model here, you want to align uh, your messaging with your customer, visitor, reader's gravity. Uh, what is their motivation? Uh, and uh, be sure you're focused on that, not on yours. Uh, then give them that nudge uh, both to uh, get their attention and get them moving down the slide. And then you want to maximize the, the angle of the slide with both conscious and non-conscious motivators, remembering that non-conscious motivators are almost always cheaper to employ than conscious ones. And then finally, you want to minimize both real and imaginary friction. Uh, and often, uh, minimizing friction is the least expensive way uh, of all to make your content as persuasive as possible and as effective as possible. So uh, if you remember just one thing from our time together here today, uh, change is constant and accelerating. Uh, we see it in communication. Uh, we see it in media and the way we consume media. Uh, we've got all these megatrends going on now with virtual reality and mobile and artificial intelligence, and these are far from played out yet. But the one thing that has not changed in 50,000 years is the human brain. That's what scientists call the period of behavioral modernity. Uh, and uh, therefore, if you want to write more persuasive content, you want to work with your reader's brain and the way it actually works. So uh, we're going to do some questions now. Uh, and I encourage you, uh, if you want a free persuasion slide guidebook, you don't need to uh, even buy the ebook. It's This pretty much stands on its own. Uh, just pop over to rogerdooley.com slash ps. Uh, and I guess now we can see if we have any questions. Byron? I really enjoyed the presentation, Roger. Thanks much. I'm sure we're going to have some questions that, that pop in here. Um, I've got a couple of already. Um, one person wanted to know, is there value to bulleted text over paragraphs, um, particularly on a sales page? Yes. I would say that bullets are often easier to process. So uh, yes, I would say that is uh, generally true. You know, I find the, the words that were chosen to use, namely a, quote, sales page, <laughs> I think selling in general is is one of the problems that we're running into. No one really wants to be sold to these days. Um, you know, the, the whole content, the customer journey, if you will, is no longer about selling and beating people up and pounding them with ads and promotions, but instead looking at what stage of the funnel they're in, ranging from discovery down through the pipeline to actually a trial and then a purchase. And I think neuromarketing, if, if you would agree with me, is tapping deeply into that experience that a customer faces through, throughout the journey. Uh, so for example, um, in the discovery stage, you probably want to stay light. People are not sure if they want, they don't want to go deep with your products or services yet and they want to experience your brand and and they're just debating whether they even need what you have so in that case you might want to stay light where bullet points might might be more appropriate but maybe when they're in the trial stage they might want to know the fine print you know to determine whether they want to in fact buy and commit um, so when you agree that it, it very much depends upon where somebody is in the customer journey it, to for the best answer to that question agree well, and how does neuromarketing play into that well, okay, you know, I think there are uh, several variables that can affect that, both in the uh, quantity of information that people want and the way it's presented. Uh, and even different customers can uh, choose, make choices different ways. Uh, for example, when I was uh, shopping for a rollerboard uh, recently, uh, I this you know just a carry-on luggage that I could take on an, an airplane. Uh, I travel quite a bit uh, in excess of 100,000 miles a year and uh, I wanted to really optimize this decision because I wanted, I knew I was going to make an investment that I hoped would last for a few years and wanted to be sure it met airline regulations, I wanted to be sure it was durable and so on and so on. Uh, as a result, uh, uh, when I visited websites to learn about products, I was digging into all the detailed specifications. I was reading reviews by the dozens or hundreds. Uh, and so uh, in that case, uh, I was uh, really looking for that other info where a more casual traveler uh, might 
just pop to a page, say, I like the way that one looks. Yep, it says it's carry-on friendly. Bingo, I'm done. So uh, you have to try and appeal sometimes to different individuals, even at, almost at the same stage of the, uh, the customer journey. Uh, then uh, as far as whether uh, you know, bullets or long-form text are uh, superior, uh, it may depend, too, on the kind of content. Um, a, I think that bullets are, in general, more easily scannable. So uh, somebody who's looking to uh, get quick information can often process those bullets uh, with less effort. So in, in general, uh, I think that uh, they have a bit of an advantage over dense text. On the other hand, if you're trying to tell a story, and we know that stories are powerful, uh, then clearly bullets are not going to serve you well. So I guess I would uh, make that judgment call and or even summarize it because uh, when uh, I read a review, if I see that somebody has left, uh, say, uh, a 10-paragraph review of the long paragraphs of dense text, uh, I may read that if I really want to, or often at the very bottom they'll summarize pros and cons. Sometimes I'll just jump down to the pros and cons to see uh, what they say, and depending on what I find there, maybe I'll go back up and read some more. Maybe I'll say, oh, I got what I need from this and move on. Mm. Great answer. Someone has a question, which is better, image or text to persuade? Uh, let's see, I would say both. Uh, you know, if you are selling uh, a fragrance, you'll see that uh, most of the ads in that market uh, only have an image, and that's in a very emotional image. Uh, it may be uh, some kind of a uh, very romantic situation or an erotically charged situation or something that may represent an, um, a, an environment of luxury uh, because all they're trying to do is communicate an emotion through an image uh, and that is how they're going to persuade you to buy that fragrance. You're, they're not going to tell you that it smells 25% better or that you get 30% free in a particular size. It's a purely emotional sale. Uh, I think that in most cases, uh, people need some emotion as well as some fact. So uh, if you are selling me, say, a piece of luggage to continue that, uh, maybe you'll show me an, uh, a guy who looks like a really serious traveler uh, uh, rolling through an airport and uh, he's uh, well-dressed, looks like a 100,000 mile a year guy uh, or whatever, or a lady. Uh, and that's going to uh, say something to me emotionally, uh, but at the same time, I'm going to want to read a little bit about the product. And one thing, too, that is important, and this is uh, something that I think when you talk about applying uh, some of these sort of neuromarketing hacks, it's important to remember that even if you are successful at persuading on a non-conscious level, often the conscious mind needs something to justify the purchase. So for instance, uh, I go for shopping for cars and I come back with the sexy red convertible. Uh, maybe non-consciously, uh, I'm thinking, wow, this is going like, to uh, take 10 years off my appearance to other people or it's going to make me attractive to women or something. Uh, but uh, consciously, uh, I know that uh, my friends are going to say, what are you doing with that red sports car? Uh, and I'm going to have to tell them that, gee, uh, the mileage it gets is amazing, uh, and it, this holds its resale value far better uh, than uh, the, that sedan model that I was looking at. So often uh, the non-conscious mind makes the decision, but then the conscious mind has to justify it. You use the phrase non-conscious, and someone had a question about the difference between non-conscious and what they mean as subconscious. Uh, non-conscious, unconscious, and subconscious tend to be used kind of interchangeably. Uh, maybe there are some folks who can draw a tight distinction, but in the uh, neuromarketing uh, industry, at least, I really uh, don't see much distinction between those terms. I tend to use non-conscious, but that's more by habit uh, than uh, anything else. And, and could you just d describe your understanding and how the emotional versus logical state play into that? Uh, well, I would say that emotions are generally uh, s at least partially non-conscious, sometimes almost completely non-conscious, uh, whereas logical is almost always conscious. 
And that, that's, where, too, where we get into the uh, Kahneman System 1 and System 2 thinking. So logical arguments engage System 2, and you may need to do a little bit of that, uh, but just recognizing that uh, that is an uncomfortable way of thinking, and people generally don't like to be in that for a long period of time. They'll try and get out of it if you force them into it. I've got a wonderfully controversial question, which I can you can happily say no. I don't want to answer that, Byron. But uh, Mr. Trump, you could argue, has displayed some very powerful neuromarketing <laughs> uh, strategy with his campaign in tapping into just incredibly emotional issues uh, and, and doing so uh, to capture media attention, grab headlines, and, you know, stir up uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, conversation, um, partly because of the often absurd nature of, of what he's bringing up. Would you agree that in, in his campaign uh, leaders may literally be tapping into neuromarketing to drive um, the attention that they're getting? Right. Well, first of all, I'm not an uh, expert on the uh, Trump campaign or anyone, anyone's campaign, but uh, I think it's a it's a fair question. The one, the one thing I would say is, uh, I would say every major political campaign uses neuromarketing techniques. Often, uh, even for instance, testing messaging using neuromarketing studies with fMRI or EEG or implicit testing or facial coding or some of the other sort of uh, hardcore neuromarketing techniques. Uh, in, in Trump's case, uh, it seems, and this is certainly uh, a total outsider perspective, uh, that it's more instinctive on his part. He doesn't seem to listen to his advisors very much, which is why he sometimes gets into these controversial statements uh, that uh, you know ends up having to walk back uh, later on. So I don't think it is a designed neuromarketing strategy so much as uh, an instinctive one. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I, would, I, would, I would be almost certain, again, I have no inside information, uh, that uh, Hillary Clinton campaign is employing neuromarketing consultants as well as the various um, com party committees, PACs, and so Good on, point. Try, yeah. trying to test their messaging. Yeah, very, so smart answer there. Um, uh, somebody had a question. Um, if, if I'm marketing a dating site, would it be better to show an image of a really hot guy or, or a really hot woman? Fascinating question. Right. Well, the uh, sort of non-neuromarketing answer to that is uh, test it. Uh, because, yeah. uh, you know, uh, even when you employ sort of best practices where uh, all the science is on the side of using the female image versus the male, uh, there's always that 5% of the time where the actual results confound you. Uh, social proof, uh, like showing that, gee, we've got uh, 12,000 uh, customers for this product or 12 million customers almost always works, but uh, every conversion expert can point to some example when they tested social proof and it actually decreased the response rate uh, and, or the conversion rate. And who knows why? Maybe it wasn't persuasive enough. Um, maybe people wanted something more exclusive, but you know, in that case, uh, social proof didn't work. So uh, the uh, almost certainly, uh, if you are trying to uh, get people of one gender to sign up, uh, perhaps showing uh, a an attractive person of the opposite gender can put them sort of in that position of, oh, you know, this is a person I, I would like to meet, and therefore I'll sign up for the site. Uh, that's that's a uh, sort of a gut feel guess, but it, I'm thinking it probably uh, makes sense. Uh, maybe even changing the image to show uh, uh, a realistic uh, situation of a person interacting on the website would be one way of doing that. But I'm guessing that's it's that it, it would vary by gender. Uh, that the same imagery that would work for one gender would not work for the other. But uh, I would I would test it regardless. Well, that's one thing that's really great about the digital world is that it enables us to test things so easily uh, and in such a conclusive way that we can really take a lot of the guesswork out of it. I mean, compare that to what uh, big ad agencies go through where they're designing their next Super Bowl commercial, and you know, maybe they can do a focus group or something, but focus groups are notoriously horrible. Uh, that's one reason why they're, they do neuromarketing studies when they're launching an expensive campaign is because they're trying to get to what people's real reactions are, and they don't have the facility to do uh, A-B testing or multivariate testing like digital marketers can. 
I've said for many years, if you're not testing your landing pages, you're living in the dark age because the you could literally double or triple your conversion rates and and therefore your revenue. Uh, you know, in 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 days, depending on the volume of traffic you have. So it's it, it's really critical. Right, um, and, and here's another thing yeah. you don't you don't know, even though as much as you know about your market, uh, that you do not know exactly how your customers are going to react every time. You you may think your instincts are bang on, but some of the time uh, they will be wrong. In fact, even David David Ogilvy, uh, long before digital marketing was a thing, said something like, "Test is the most important." word in the advertiser's vocabulary or some, some I, I mangle that I'm sure but uh, even uh, back in the pre-digital days uh, he was a huge advocate for testing. Reminds me of my favorite David, David Ogilvy quote something like this if we hire people greater than ourselves we will become a company of giants if we hire people lesser than ourselves we will become a company of dwarfs. <laughs> he like hired that. some smart people it's a great quote I've said it many times. Um, Let's see, what is the most fundamental book to read on the subject of neuromarketing? Um, uh, and, and I would argue your book. <laughs> right, well, it's, uh, mine is a very uh, practical, tactical kind of book. Uh, it's not a theoretical book. Uh, if you're looking for sort of a broad sweep of um, underlying theory, uh, believe it or not, uh, the a Dummy's Guide uh, to Neuromarketing is actually a rather intelligent book and it covers a lot of ground, both sort of hardcore neuromarketing techniques uh, uh, that might be used by big brands as well as some of the more psychology oriented issues uh, that come into play. So, I, you know, to me that's um, uh, probably as, as good an intro as you can get. If you're looking for a very readable book on the topic, it's a few years out of date now, but just sort of a uh, a fun read would be Biology by Martin Lindstrom. Uh, that's He gets into neuromarketing testing in there. And his follow-on book to that, Brand Washed, is told from the consumer perspective, uh, but that's also quite interesting. And it gets into some of the sort of great psychology techniques used by retailers. Uh, uh, he focuses on Whole Foods quite a bit. All the little visual cues they give you in their stores, even to the point where they print up signs that look like chalkboards uh, that are actually printed signs uh, to make it look as if uh, the person behind the fish counter just put that uh, sign up uh, using chalk uh, half an hour ago when in fact uh, it's, uh, it's a printed sign. Uh, they put out giant uh, uh, displays of fish with heads and tails and everything on ice not because they expect you to buy that big ugly fish with a head on it uh, but because it conveys the impression of freshness uh, to the, across their entire product line. And a shout out uh, to my friend Douglas Van Preet, who uh, has been a guest host, uh, a guest here on our webinar series, and also was a keynote speaker at Content Marketing Conference, our big annual conference every year. He wrote a great book called Unconscious Branding, How Neuroscience Can Empower uh, Marketing. Yes, Empower well, and I inspire. highly recommend that yeah. book, too. Yes, it, great that is book, awesome book, great yeah. guy, very, very, very awesome book. Um, he yeah, really Douglas nails it. He read everything on the topic, and uh, if you're yep. looking for a guide to further reading, uh, that's that's a great book because he's read everything and he's got a really extensive list of references. So I would highly recommend that too. Yep. Good, good first one. Um, okay, let's see. Um, in email copy, how do I balance storytelling versus TMI? Well, of course, the one-word answer would be test uh, to see which responds better because that's easy to do yeah. with email. Uh, you know, I think that uh, there's uh, not an easy uh, there, there's not an easy answer for that question. It depends a lot on uh, your following the people you're emailing, how interested they are in your topic or in you personally. Uh, there are some people who have uh, very devoted tribes that can get away with writing super long emails. Uh, there are others who uh, are very brief and to the point. Uh, I think I'm sure that a few people in the audience subscribe to uh, Tim Ferriss uh, and his, uh, he has this five bullets newsletter that's very brief. I suspect that if he wanted to do a long form email, he does podcasts that run two hours typically, which is super long for a podcast. I, I would guess that he could write a, uh, you know, a five screen or a 10 screen email if he wanted and people would read it, uh, but he's chosen to go very short form. On the other hand, if you are in a uh, sort of a persuasive process uh, that you really sort of need to 
get a bunch of information out to uh, people, uh, then writing a really engaging story is uh, is one way to do it. And the only thing you can do is test, though. Uh, you can use tools, too, to see you know how far people are scrolling. If you uh, have it on a web page, for example, there, there are ways you can gauge if you're losing your reader or not. Uh, somebody wanted to learn about reviews. How do reviews play into the mind and the, the unconscious, if you will? Um, specifically, when you read reviews, do they rely more on, on content or the star rating themselves? And then there was a follow-up of, um, it could be an issue, uh, you know, where you're needing new pants and you're too tall, but do you look for reviews that talk about pants that, that you purchased that might have been too long? You know, so um, how do you... What, what's happening in the mind when it comes to reviews? Well, again, I think it's the mindset of the buyer that uh, is the first influence. So uh, if I'm buying a, uh, a USB cable or something, and uh, I see that it's got uh, four and a half stars or better, uh, I'm not even going to read review. I'm just going to say, okay, uh, this is the kind of cable I need. Uh, it can't suck too badly. Uh, I'm, I'm going to buy it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as you mentioned, if I'm buying a product that I'm concerned that some aspect of it isn't right, uh, the, uh, then I'm going to read reviews in more detail. I'm going to search the reviews uh, to see if anybody mentions, uh, like length, for example, in the case of the pants. Uh, not long ago, I was uh, uh, buying a watch, and uh, I like a watch with luminous hands because when I travel, I I'll wear it so that it, even if the hotel has no clock or anything else, I've got it right there. And uh, so, uh, weirdly, I'm probably one out of a thousand visitors that really assiduously searched the reviews uh, to see if people said that the luminosity was good. So I, I think it's really all over the map. Uh, some folks will look at the negative reviews to see what people didn't like about it. That's a pretty common strategy that I've heard uh, repeated over and over again, and I know I've done that myself. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody really cares about the five-star review that loved it. They want to know, well, what, what did people find wrong with this, and am yeah. I going to have the same problem? Hmm. Interesting. Someone had a question about neuromarketing in the financial services industry. Do you have any experience there, and have you learned anything you could share? Uh, yeah, you know, I've actually uh, done a, a little bit of work in the financial services industry, and um, the... Uh, they, there's a bunch of issues there that are kind of unique uh, to that space uh, because of uh, uh, perhaps compliance issues. In some cases, uh, the content of marketing is more disclaimers and cautions and so on uh, than the uh, what you're trying to get across to the customer, potential customer. And what I've seen some uh, organizations do that I believe are more successful uh, is find ways to be sure that the, uh, the necessary uh, legal requirements are met for you know, disclaimers and notifications and so on, but uh, that don't detract from the message. Uh, and even, if, of course, it can even affect the text where if, uh, uh, you know, you've got a really strong legal department that's reviewing the text, uh, they may tone it down so much that your message is not getting through at all. And I think, uh, like any business decision, uh, you need sort of an overriding uh, business executive who can balance uh, risks against rewards and say, okay, uh, we're going to uh, do it this way uh, that meets most of those needs but doesn't uh, totally destroy our copy. Uh, and, and okay, obviously, well, too, some, of the, some, of the, some of the factors, too, that you're appealing to uh, are uh, long-term need for security. Uh, you can get into issues of uh, loss fr framing versus gain framing. In general, loss framing uh, is more powerful than gain framing. So in, instead of telling people what they might benefit by acting, telling people what they might lose by not acting could be more persuasive. My favorite the final question <clears throat> came from um, a, a little bit outside of the zone, but I love it. Can I use neuroscience to lose excess weight? <laughs> so neuroscience yes. question for you and losing weight. Tell us a little bit about some companies, actually, that are probably using neuroscience to help you lose weight. Well, I think that probably uh, it's less neuroscience uh, and more... Uh, habit formation, uh, and there's been a lot of research on habits and uh, habit formation uh, that play directly into uh, losing weight. Uh, uh, my friend and uh, local 
Austin UT professor here, Art Markman, uh, wrote a book called Smart Change, and he talks about uh, uh, changing habits. And certainly, uh, one, of, one of my favorite topics is the last element of the persuasion slide, friction. Uh, and by manipulating friction, you can change your habits. If you're trying to, uh, say, really get yourself to uh, take a run first thing in the morning, uh, then uh, putting your uh, running clothes right at the side of your bed, for example, or maybe sleeping in uh, uh, your running clothes uh, is makes it so easy. You don't have to think about, oh, i gotta got to hunt that stuff down, go look in the closet for the shoes and everything. Uh, uh, that's reducing friction, whereas, for instance, for uh, avoiding eating fattening foods, uh, increasing the friction to get to them, uh, not uh, uh, putting them uh, on the counter in front of you. Google uh, they had this rather interesting uh, behavioral intervention. Uh, they were uh, using literally millions of M&Ms in, I think it was their New York City office. It was a large office and they had uh, bowls of M&Ms out everywhere. Uh, and uh, simply by uh, changing to uh, opaque containers where people couldn't see the M&Ms, making healthier items more visible and prominent, uh, they were able to reduce uh, calorie consumption. Uh, I, they, they had some crazy metrics for this, but just those like little simple behavioral nudges uh, can have a big impact. And of course, uh, as Art, Art Markman said, that uh, his consumption of his favorite ice cream really went down uh, when he did not actually have it in his house. Mm. Roger, I want to thank you. You have covered all the bases today, especially with this last question. Thank you so much for your insights. No problem. Hey, I really enjoyed it, Byron. Well, I have another hundred questions for you, but we'll save that for another phone call conversation. Right. You, <laughs> you and I have had some wonderful conversations, and I look forward to continuing collaboration and also discussion uh, with you about Content Marketing Conference and, and your presence there if we can make it work. So uh, thanks again for tuning in. Great chatting, Byron. Right on. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll see you next month.